أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته my dear brothers and sisters I wanted to share with you some uh, thoughts uh, as we approach the month of Ramadan uh, this uh, Ramadan is, is certainly uh, unique in many ways. Uh, last Ramadan, unfortunately, we were in a situation where we could not uh, come to the masjid because it was in the midst of, of the beginning of, of this horrible pandemic that has affected the entire world, including us in Santa Clarita and Los Angeles County. Uh, this year, we are kind of in a transition phase uh, in which we can go back to the masjid and inshallah, we will be going back to the masjid, but there are some precautions and some rules that we need to talk about and some changes to how we do things normally uh, from years prior to the pandemic. And inshallah, we'll return to those years in the future. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to lift this calamity and to really bring us back to the masjid to full capacity and full force and to perform our worship the way we are used to doing it over many years. Uh, I don't think this year is going to be that year, but um, inshallah, it will be coming the following year uh, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, decides that for us. So I want to talk a little bit about this Ramadan during uh, COVID. Now, a lot of people feel that COVID is uh, subsiding. And it is true that in Los Angeles County, the number of cases and the number of deaths from COVID um, uh, has declined significantly over the past month uh, and continues to decline daily. However, uh, and we, we don't really know the reasons for that. Some of it has to do with the fact that many people have been vaccinated, uh, although really the number of people vaccinated still are insufficient to really provide that full uh, herd immunity that, that uh, public health officials talk about. But it certainly has helped. Uh, it also may be that the, the coronavirus is in many ways uh, seasonal in nature, and maybe we're right now just simply in a season where it's not flourishing. It also may be that the surge we saw in January and February was a result of the December holidays and people being out of school and families visiting each other more frequently perhaps than they did prior to that, and that now that is uh, subsiding. However, there are some serious concerns amongst public health officials that we may be coming upon another surge because of what is happening in Europe and what is happening in many other states around the country where the number of COVID cases is rising. So since we are at such a good juncture, it is important that we as Californians, as um, Los Angeles residents, as Santa Clarita residents, that we really maintain our vigilance to try to keep the numbers down. We don't want us, any one of us, uh, and, and I mean all of us residing in, in this area, to be instigators of a resurgence of COVID. And it's really, really important. So to that effect, if you have symptoms of COVID, fever, cough, shortness of breath, if you have any of those symptoms, do not come to the masjid. We all love the masjid. We want to come to the masjid. We want to worship Allah and Ramadan in the masjid. But... What's more important in Islam is that you protect your brothers and your sisters in the masjid and you not expose them to harm. The Prophet says, la darara wa la dirar. There is no harm or harmfulness. Don't, don't be harmful to other people. That's not allowed as Muslims. So be careful. If you have symptoms of COVID, stay home, get tested. If you have COVID, you have to quarantine. If you don't have COVID and your symptoms are due to something else, you may have another infection. Again, don't come to the masjid and spread that other infection, whatever, whatever it may be. If you have COVID also, do not fast because fasting may weaken your immune system and your ability to fight COVID. So be careful about that as well, particularly if you have some severe symptoms of COVID. Many people have COVID but don't have symptoms. They probably could fast without much difficulty, especially if they're younger in age. So. Discuss that with your with your physician or your healthcare professional and, and come to a decision on the best thing you should do. I will tell you all that I'm a member of the healthcare task force of the Islamic Shura Council of Southern California. And um, they are a group of really wonderful people, uh, physicians, um, uh, pharmacists, nurses, other healthcare professionals 
who uh, really uh, come together and discuss Islamic issues uh, of uh, health and, and health related concerns. And we did have a meeting not too long ago to discuss uh, Ramadan during the, this time. And uh, in fact, uh, the healthcare, healthcare Task Force published uh, some guidelines uh, in relation to uh, the masajid and how they should operate uh, during uh, the pandemic and during Ramadan during this pandemic. And I do know uh, that the Department of Public Health and the Supreme Court have allowed masajid to operate at 25% capacity. I just learned that the LA County Department of Health has moved to orange tier and that we can operate at 50% capacity. I have not reviewed that detail yet, uh, so I'll qualify that. Now, in regards to the message, we're gonna go back to the message, but there are gonna be some limitations and it's important that we respect and observe these limitations. The first is that we must social distance. So we have to remain two meters apart or six feet apart while in the message. And this includes during the prayer. And I know that makes pe some people feel uncomfortable because we're used to standing side by side in prayer. But every scholar throughout the Muslim world, including here in North America, have ruled that we can stand in line six feet apart during the Jama'ah prayer. And that that is in fact what we should do to protect others who are in the masjid from acquiring COVID infection or from, from someone who may be infected and not know that they're infected. The second thing we should attend to, which is really the most important thing in preventing COVID is washing your hands frequently. This can be done with sanitizer or it can be done with soap and water. Uh, and I encourage you to do that repeatedly because that's one of the most important things. We have, all have a tendency to touch our eyes, nose, mouth, ears, and that's how the virus kind of enters your body. So wash your hands before you do that, be aware, try to keep your hands below your neck as much as possible. Bring your own prayer rug. Uh, that way uh, your secretions when you're praying, even though you're gonna be wearing a mask, the mask is not 100% protective. There will be some leakage of secretions onto the rug. And so it will be your own rug that nobody else will use but you. Uh, the bathroom facilities are another place where transmission could occur because people are in close proximity to each other in a small bathroom and um, they also will have bodily secretions um, in the bathroom. So um, the recommendation is to minimize the number of people who use the bathroom at the same time. So either only one or two people depending on the size of the bathroom and whether those two people can remain six feet apart. As for each of us individually, I recommend that you perform your wudu at home before coming to the masjid. And if you require another wudu during the, the whole taraweeh prayer, then of course you can use the bathroom. But again, beware of the limitation. So please be cooperative with any uh, brothers who are administering uh, administrators at the masjid who, who may tell you, well, you have to wait, you can't go in yet. Don't get upset. Um, we're all in this together and we all need to stand together uh, to do the right thing. Um, continue to remember that there will be no handshaking, no hugging, no kissing. We, we love each other. We want to greet each other. We're used to handshaking. We're used to a hug, but not at this time, inshallah, next year. Uh, the idea is that violates the six feet apart rule, which is really what we should be doing. Imams, um, many of them have chosen to shorten the, uh, the prayer. And I want to spend a little bit of time on that because there's, there are a lot of misconceptions regarding this matter. Uh, one misconception is a lot of people feel that we must complete the recitation of the entire Quran during Taraweeh prayer. First of all, that is not even a sunnah. The sunnah is that the Prophet ﷺ used to read the Quran in its entirety uh, during the month of Ramadan. He used to say that Jibreel would come and descend every year and review the Quran during the month of Ramadan in its entirety. Uh, but it was not during Taraweeh, so it was during the month of Ramadan. It has become, however, a tradition in many Muslim societies to read the Quran its, in its entirety during the Taraweeh. And that is a great tradition. I'm not saying it's wrong or we shouldn't do it. We should continue to try to maintain that, but not this year. I think this year we may have to deviate. And imams are encouraged to shorten the prayer. We still should try. We should still try to read the Quran in its entirety, but perhaps we can do some reading outside of Taraweeh 
specifically, maybe on through an online or a Zoom uh, environment or even sitting in the masjid six feet apart. But lengthening the prayer means we're inside longer and that means greater exposure to and, and greater risk of uh, being infected with COVID. Now, um, that's one issue regarding reading the Quran. The second issue is whether the prayer should be eight rakahs or 20 rakahs. First of all, from the Islamic standpoint, I wanna be very clear because there's a lot of controversy about this and people argue all the time, it's totally unnecessary. Both are correct and both are valid. The Prophet وسلم, himself only prayed eight rakats. However, after the death of the Prophet وسلم, Umar ibn al-Khattab when he was the Khalifa, he decided that it should be 20 rakats because he felt that people were detached from the Quran and they were detached from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they were developing bad habits. Can you imagine? I mean, where do we stand compared to that environment? But that's how what he thought. So he told people to pray 20 rakahs for tarawih. And many scholars say that any sunnah or any action taken by Umar ibn al-Khattab or Abu Bakr al-Siddiq or Uthman ibn Affan or Ali ibn Abi Talib can be considered a sunnah because these are great sahaba. They are guaranteed al jannah. They lived through Islam from the beginning and they were closest to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so their opinion matters. We shouldn't discount them and say, oh, it's not a sunnah because the prophet didn't do it. No, it is important. So it, in many scholars consider it a sunnah in and of itself. And those who do not consider it a sunnah say that it is mustahab, meaning it is good. If people do 20, then inshallah, they'll have more reward. So we never, I will never ever say 20 is wrong. That's not correct. Eight is right and 20 is right. The people who want to do 20 should not point the finger at the people who do eight and say you are lazy. And the people who do eight should not point the finger at the people who do 20 and saying you're being excessive. No, that's not correct. Both are valid, eight and 20. Now, is there more risk if we do 20 in the masjid instead of eight? I personally feel there isn't much risk because the exposure to each other is already happening in the first eight, Risha and the first eight. So adding on the 12, I don't think it's increasing the risk, particularly if there's good ventilation inside the masjid. So I don't feel that there is a tremendous increased risk, particularly if we make each rak'ah shorter than usual uh, during that time, then I think the risk is minimal. And I don't see any problem with doing uh, 20. I know some administrators at some of the masjid may like, like to hear that, but my job is to tell you the truth. And, and that's how, how I feel about it. Now, one of the things that uh, has come up is whether we should be wearing masks in the masjid if everybody in the masjid is vaccinated. Now, some masjid have decided to only allow vaccinated people inside the building and have arranged for an outside prayer for those who are not vaccinated. And that is indeed recommended by the health care task force of the Shura Council. And I think it is prudent. And I think it is being cautious. And I think the, resp the responsibility, the message it has a responsibility to protect uh, the worshipers who are coming. And I think that is a good way to protect them. Now, what about people not wearing a mask who are in the masjid and they're vaccinated? Do they have to wear a mask? So they're in the masjid inside the structure, they are vaccinated. Do they have to wear a mask? That is an important question that has come up. The CDC has said that if people are vaccinated in small gatherings, meaning three to four people, they do not have to wear a mask. Now, that recommendation is not exactly what is happening in the masjid, because in the masjid, there's going to be more than three or four people. So the risk of transmission is multiplied, it's increased. The second issue is that after the CDC made its recommendation that we don't have to wear masks in small gathering, Pfizer published data just yesterday saying that their vaccine is 91% effective in the real world. So in the study, it was 95%, 94.7% effective. But in the real world, because the people taking the vaccine in the real world are not research participants who tend to be healthy, specifically chosen, whatnot, just regular people like you and me, when they looked and tested everyone, they found that at six months, it was 91% effective. Which means, that there still is a 9% chance that you can get infected even though you have been vaccinated. Now, because you've been vaccinated, the chance of dying from that infection is much less, but you still could be significantly ill. 
So when we think about this, when we're, we're together inside the structure, there still is that 9% chance that we could infect each other if someone, one of us is infected. And so I think it would be safer and more prudent to keep the mask on. Now you can wear a cloth mask. I don't think there's anything. I know they say, you know, the fat, the, 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 the other masks are the surgical masks are better than the, 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 the fabric masks, but still the fabric masks are adequate particularly if you've already been vaccinated and if everyone inside the masjid is vaccinated or at least the majority are. So my recommendation to the masjid is to continue to require masks inside the masjid because they are responsible for the protection of the worshipers. And I think it would be prudent to do that for the time being. Another issue and something we also cherish and love in Ramadan is community iftars, whether it's on the weekend, some masjid do it every night, uh, th there is a strong recommendation not to have any community iftars in the masajid this year. Now, a drive-through iftar in which volunteers give prepackaged meals to people who drive up and, and they give it to them, that is certainly something that is commendable and it minimizes the risk as long as the volunteers are wearing a mask and those driving up are wearing a mask as well. We do think that uh, masajid should recommend outside or should hold outside prayers if the structure or the, the environment allows for it. So if it's raining or something, it may not be suitable, or if it's extremely hot, may not be suitable, or if the masjid doesn't have an outside capacity. So they, you know, they, many people holding in the parking lot, but where are people going to park? If there's no place for them to park, then that's not going to be feasible. It depends on each masjid and, and their circumstances and their physical layout and, and environment. Um, we also recommend that masajid have improved ventilation for the inside of the masjid. So the windows should be open, there should be adequate ventilation inside the masjid. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, preparing for Ramadan uh, with things that are not affected by the pandemic. There are many things we can still do in Ramadan and we should do. Uh, that have nothing to do with COVID. For example, praying extra at home. There's nothing that says you cannot pray at home. Uh, you have the safety of your, of your own house. The people around you are in your household. You've already been exposed to them and they've been exposed to you. So doing extra prayers in the home is safe. Reading of the Quran during the day and at night are both safe and have nothing to do with COVID. Reading the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and the seerah of the Prophet, also safe. Giving sadaqah and donations to the masjid, highly encouraged during Ramadan. The reward is multiplied when you do that during Ramadan. Inshallah, the masjid will be holding a fundraiser during Ramadan. Make sure you participate. They're going to have different avenues to pay, whether it's online or sending a check. Don't miss out on that. Many Muslims like to pay their zakah during the month of Ramadan for magnified rewards. Um, if you plan to do that, begin your calculations now. We're only 11 days away from Ramadan. So begin your calculations now so that you can be prepared to make your payments for zakat during the month of Ramadan. It's important during this month for those who are fasting to uh, try to maintain adequate health uh, because we are in the middle of a pandemic still. And even if you're vaccinated, you could get infected. And you want your immune system to be optimal and ready to fight this virus if you were to become infected. So make sure that when you break your fast and during the time that we're allowed to eat and drink, that you hydrate well, that you drink enough fluids. That's one of the problems. We tend not to drink enough fluids. Be careful. If you are taking medications, whether they be for diabetes or high blood pressure or any other illness that you may have. Discuss with your doctor the timing of the medications. Explain to them the fasting and how there may need to be some change in the timing of your medications. Uh, eat healthy and give yourself some time to exercise if you can. If you're not able to fast, if you have an illness that precludes you from fasting, then if it is a temporary illness, you can make up the days you did not fast later uh, before the next Ramadan or if it's an illness that is chronic and that will uh, uh, prevent you from fasting uh, now or in the future, then you have to feed one needy person for every day that you do not 
fast and rem and reminder that the reward is the same just because you did you're not able to do the fast does not mean that you get less reward than those who are able to fast so make sure that you um, pay that money to feed one needy person it does not have to be money you can also pay them in food that is certainly allowed as well but a little bit harder to do logistically now um, and and you don't have to pay them here you can pay them in any country you want so if you feel that um, now but the amount of payment this is important okay you can't say you know in Syria you know five dollars can buy you you know a very decent meal but here it won't you have to pay from what is kind of the middle ground for the society you live in and from what you normally eat. So you can calculate what your average cost for eating is during a day for, for iftar and suhoor. You can calculate what that would be. And that's the amount you have to pay. So let's say it's $10 and you would pay for each day $10. Some recommend $12 per day. Some recommend 15. The more, the better. There is no uh, really maximum. You can pay whatever you wish, uh, but uh, make sure it's not too little so that you fulfill your obligation. Uh, so I, it's a short message, but uh, I didn't want to make this too long and, and bore you. Um, I, uh, again, go back to the reminder that we are concerned as healthcare professionals uh, that there may be another surge coming our way. And we as Muslims don't want to be instrumental in bringing that surge forward or in spreading it when it occurs. So I think we all need to be vigilant. We need to be prudent. And most important, we need to be patient. And please, please, I know all the brothers who are working in all of the masajid in Santa Clarita and outside of Santa Clarita, I know many of the brothers working in other masajid as well. They're trying to do the right thing. Please don't get upset with the board. Don't get upset with the volunteers. They are trying to do what's right for the community. They're not doing this for themselves. They're not putting restrictions to make our lives difficult. They're doing it to protect us, to protect the community. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. And we ask Allah to reward them. And we ask Allah to give them and enable them to do the right thing for the community and to protect the members of the community. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to reach Ramadan. That was the dua of the Sahaba. They used to, before Ramadan, they would say, we ask Allah to allow us to reach Ramadan. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to benefit from Ramadan and to reap the rewards of Ramadan. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us fast Ramadan and to make it easy for us and to magnify our rewards during this time. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward you for listening. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make your fast acceptable and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward you immensely for all the good deeds that you are going to do during the month of Ramadan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.